So the Latin American theme from the Yes, the Young Epilepsy section, are pleased to welcome our speakers, Dr. Denis Lau and Dr. Eduardo Perez Palma, for joining us in this ILE Academy Endorsed webinar series. The aim for this series are to bring to Latin America and to the world top renowned speakers to teach and show us their latest findings in epilepsy. We are confident that our audience will get the most of our speakers and their messages will enable them to keep updated in this fascinating and challenging topic, epilepsy. The learning objectives for today's webinars are decide on which patients to do genetic testing, decide what type of genetic testing to conduct, interpret and apply the results of genetic testing accurately in the clinical context. Please fill the corresponding evaluation form during the webinar. We will have five minutes at the end of each talk and your queries should be written in the comment box just at the end of each talk. Thank you very much. As our first speaker, we have Dr. Denis Lau. He is a biomedical data scientist who specializes on the human genetics of epilepsy. His primary affiliation is with the Cleveland Clinic Genomic Medicine Institute and the Epilepsy Center of the Cleveland Clinic. In addition, Dr. Lau is also affiliated with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard University at Cambridge, as well as the Cologne Center of Genomics in Germany. His team uses genetic data from in-house and globally collected patient cohorts to discover genes related to epilepsy syndromes, to develop novel methods for interpreting missense variants, and to characterize patients with disease trajectories. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Lal. Thank you. So I'm here with Eduardo. Eduardo and I um, are in the same research group, and we're working together. And um, to, um, I will start with a big picture um, uh, lecture about um, epilepsy and genetics and a little bit about variant interpretation. And then at the uh, end, um, Eduardo will give a seminar, actually, what kind of guidelines are out there and how to apply them in a um, straightforward way. And I'm really excited to uh, kick off um, the um, young epilepsy session because everyone younger than 40 is considered as young in the epilepsy world. And I think that's probably the, one of the only places in the world where less than 40 is young and I'm um, really happy to be part of it. Same as Eduardo. So, <laughs> good. So, um, let's um, directly jump in. So, before I go much into detail and um, the talk um, was uh, listed as accurate or adequate interpretation of genetic testing and this is a really um, uh, challenging term um, because genetic testing is so new and um, so fast moving that it's really at the boundaries of science and um, established knowledge and not so established knowledge. And this has been seen recently that, you know, some tests become re-evaluated and there are studies on this, um, which have just been published in last year, um, that showing that looking at a test again um, with, a, and with a new knowledge and an expert team might lead to this different decision in some patients. So, and... Um, this is why it's very important, and that will be the, the theme throughout my talk, um, that you need to have um, really expert knowledge or experts um, with you who can help interpreting genetic test results. There's nothing you can just do um, without really going into this. Um, nonetheless, you can become an expert um, as a neurologist, as a pediatrician. It's no big deal. It takes a little bit of effort, and, but you can do it. So, But what you should not do is just trying to interpret without training, right? So, which has been, I am, sounds, sounds obvious, but this has been done until recently quite a bit. But now we have so much information in genetics that it should not be done anymore. And there are even positions like in the US, like the genetic counselor, which are fully dedicated um, to do this. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I will start with um, a lecture about, um, you know, epilepsy genetics and a little bit about variant interpretation, give it like a hint what our research group is doing, but overall it will be more like an educative uh, lecture. And I'm really looking forward to challenging questions that we can brainstorm a little bit together, how to look at these things. And then um, Eduardo will go into the current guidelines, how to look at variant interpretation, how you can actually apply this. There are some, there are some software which you can use. 
and can already start informing yourself that you can you know interact better with geneticists and or even when you become really sufficient and your country allows that can even interpret genetic tests okay so I start a little bit background with genetics. So um, for most of um, you that might be um, obvious or some other might be that might be new, but let's really set the ground rules. So what we have to remember is that we have every gene twice, right? One uh, from dad, one from mom. And just how we think about this, what, what this gene do and do is like they, are like, um, they encode active molecules in our body. And at the end, um, um, there's an intermediate step, which is the RNA, but at the end, there's the active molecule in our body are proteins. And if you have two genes, you can think about it, each does 50% of the proteins which we have in our body. So two genes, two RNA molecules, two um, proteins, if you want to, simplified speaking. And then if you think about uh, variants, um, that's a word what people frequently use for mutations. It's not identical, but we just can move it forward for this like this. There are some variants which can change um, one part of the um, gene, uh, one gene, so and one nucleotide actually. So that you can think about this as change in the construction plan of a protein. And this is what happens at the end. The RNA has it. And at the end also the protein is a little bit different than the version which it has doesn't have the mutated uh, yet the mutation, and that can be pathogenic, but doesn't have to be. And how this is pathogenic, we don't know. And that's a very important um, for the variant interpretation, especially when it comes to drugs. So then there are these other kinds of variants which are called nonsense or frame shift variants. These variants are that bad that the body that you ha don't have a. In contrast, here you have like a different version of a protein, whereas here you don't have it at all because it's already the mRNA gets degraded and it's called nonsense mediated decay. So at the end you have less protein, and that has been shown for many epilepsies that less protein and the non-functional protein can, uh, seems to be like um, the uh, disease causing mechanism, and we call it hyper insufficiency. Another way how you can have less protein is simply you only have one gene instead of two. And there can also be large gen genetic changes, which can also happen, um, can be inherited or can also be happen de novo. So not present in the parent, but in the child. And then there are other events where you have too much genes. So, for example, um, that you have at the end three copies of a gene, although the average person has only two. And this uh, situation can also lead to the fact that you have too much protein. So too much protein is can, can be also be harmful in some situations, and they're good examples, um, examples for an epilepsy. And there's also examples where you have mutations which change the protein that it's functioning too much. And that can also be similar to like having too much of the protein itself. There are also mutations which lead to non-functioning, and then it's very similar to having half of the protein, like in these kind of conditions. And then we call it haploinsufficiency. So already here, I use a lot of terms and to confuse you, but I hope that we resolve that um, more when we go through the text. So this is an interesting slide. Um, today, um, I hope everyone will just say, why genetic testing? Because they are drugs. But this is um, not so established um, for people, or like if you looked at like two or three years back, not much more, right? People would really challenge, why should we do genetic testing? Because at that time, two or three years ago, we would say, hey, some patients um, might get a diagnosis. And then many um, classical or, um, or genealogists uh, from an older generation might say, yeah, why? okay, so sure, you get a diagnosis, but um, does that help us in clinical management? You know? So um, I would always answer, as a, you know, I have a strong bias, I'm a geneticist, and I would say, yeah, sure, that helps you for the reason that you don't have to go to you know, thousands of um, specialists to find out why these um, children or people are ill, right? So you can just get the diagnosis. You can also um, get the information um, on the molecular way. Why do you have this disease? And then you, um, what happens beautifully already like many years ago with the Drive Foundation is the beginning. So is that you can find other patients um, on, on this planet even, um, or in your country, and now even in your state, or, which have the same um, underlying reason why they have epilepsy, because they have mutations in the same gene. And frequently, these patients are basically like biological twins. And you can learn a lot from the older patients if you, for example, um, are a younger patient or have a child with, um, who has this disorder. And so then you can lo learn a lot because... To some degree, um, there is, they are biologically very similar. And also, this allows to look at already 
in a young child what problems the child might develop later on. And that might be not related to epilepsy, it might be muscular problems, or might be um, related problems to cognitive um, um, you know, abilities. And that there, what kind? Of, and you can already learn from other parents um, or people and um, what kind of therapies were beneficial. And so that was the old situation. But today we can nicely say there are good examples where um, genetic testing um, affects patient management. And the strongest example um, is probably um, the gene SSC2A1. Here, where, when, you, um, when you have a child or a person with a genetic variant in that gene, that person is very likely to develop um, some kind of um, delay, and that, which can be pretty severe. And this is the reason is because the gene um, and, and codes or is the, basically the building plan to a sugar transporter to the brain. And if this transporter is not working properly, then you have not enough sugar in the brain and that leads to this um, delay at the end and the seizures. However, you can just bypass this um, mechanism by having um, a ketogenic diet where you get um, other kind of en energy metabolites in the brain due to the uh, different um, metabolism. And then um, you avoid all the epilepsy and um, the other side effects. If you start early enough, but that's a different topic. So, but here you can directly see genetic testing is important because the delay and the um, encephalopathy the children have, they are not they are not so obvious and specific. You you cannot clinically say, okay, that must be SSC um, SSC two A one. You cannot you cannot do that. So you need to do the genetic test or at least confirm that you have the, um, that your child has this um, disorder and then you can make this clinical decision or you can do it together. So, and you might able, if you might be the world's experts um, who sees patients like this, frequently you might at the end be able to see it, but most people don't because it's a rare disease. And this is true for my, most of these disorders. And I don't want to go more into this detail. You can see the table here and there are many reviews which you can read, the references are there. But one thing I want to stress really strongly is what we learned recently, um, and the really recently is like the last two, three years, is that for many of these disorders, um, there are multiple mechanisms um, which um, one gene can lead to disease. And SCN2 is a very good example for that. You can have patients which have um, a variant or mutation in this gene which encodes an ion channel in, brain, in, in neurons. You yeah, can have patients which have a mutation which leads to a channel which is basically too active. The, at the end, that leads to the situation that there's too much firing, at least how we think about this at the moment. And then you have patients who have variants which lead to too less channel or to channels which don't work. So at the same time, here you have um, then not much, uh, not enough firing on a um, network level. So, and both can lead to epilepsies, but the epilepsies are clinically relatively different, relatively, there's also intermediate types, but your treatment um, with this um, a, um, drugs which are already out can, works best for those with these early onset neonatal epilepsies, which are based on gain of function. So, which is not true for those truncating loss of function variants. So, it's a lot of terms I use here. So, but the thing is, to, uh, the take-home message is, the, knowing the gene and being certain that the variant is pathogenic is not enough for many epilepsy genes. And we are just really early in this understanding. And that will probably get more complicated. You also need to know what the variant does. And... There are uh, ways to explore that, and it's really a rapidly evolving field. So again, that's the underlying theme. So it's relatively complicated to take experts um, into account when interpreting or working with genetic test results. So one really cool thing is that if I will, um, I'm very certain if I will give this talk in two or three years, now maybe let's say five years, five years, probably I can give some good examples where um, targeted treatments which specifically tackle um, the... Um, yeah, gene um, or RNA level um, will be available. Or it, I'm actually, I'm optimistic. Now. Let's call it an optimistic. In five years, I believe there will be one available. And how good it is, we, we will see. But at least at the moment, we, can, we know that there have been at least five, six big pharma companies who which got, each got um, like funds for more than 100 million 
to develop treatment programs for monogenic and severe epilepsies. So I think we came from the situation that we um, only like within 10 years, we came to the situation that for many patients, we understand now why they are ill. Then we now already um, have learned in the last years what, and we're still learning what kind of drugs exist, which are beneficial for our management, which are beneficial for some of those patients. And now we are really approaching in reconfiguring um, the genetic defect with a really precise treatment to overcome the problem. Full disclosure, I'm a scientist. I'm a very optimistic person. But I'm, if I follow the, really the big conferences where, where we have been the last years, I think the people in the wet lab and um, the big companies and also the basic research, uh, all the molecular work, they did amazing work and really a lot of people are really pushing forward. And I think it's a good time to be hopeful. So 10 years ago, totally, totally different story. Okay, so coming back to genetic testing, what type of genetic testing are out there? Um, if it would be me, I would only talk about whole genome sequencing because that's the best, but this is not clinical practice. So we have to go a little bit historically from karyotyping which, and genotyping and then sing, sequencing single genes at the end to sequencing all genes in the whole genome. So again, if you look at these molecular defects I presented before, here we see now that there are certain sequencing technologies which capture um, a few genes to um, all genes. So Sanger sequencing is only one gene. Panels are usually are between, let's say, 30 to um, 200 genes. So only genes which you already know to cause disease or likely to cause disease. And then we have exome sequencing, which looks at all genes. And what they miss um, frequently, but this is improving at the moment due to newer algorithms, um, they, make, they, they, they miss the larger changes in the genome. And these are these situations where you have the gene fully gone or um, too much. And here, um, um, classical methods like karyotyping and, and genotyping are working. Usually, new panels combine um, these kind of things, so it's not missed if you have it in a specific um, epilepsy gene. However, nevertheless, um, whole genome sequencing finds everything. And we are approaching already now the stage where interpretation is, is more expensive than data generation. And um, again, optimistic view, in a few years, we do directly whole genome sequencing. In a few, I mean less than five. But again, optimistic person. So now we're coming to genetic testing specifically to epilepsies. So where are we, right? So let's look, let's look a little bit more big picture. So um, what genetic testing at the end is like a diagnosis, right? So what kind of um, diagnosis are there out for epilepsy and how they are evolving? How, how much do people talk about this? How, what is a hot topic? What people are trying to implement and where do people do research on? Because research is very correlated with clinical application. So what we see here is now a percentage of all research articles in PubMed. So you know, most of you are PubMed, the research database. And in combination with the term epilepsy and, for example, EEG. And you see, like EEG, basically, um, round, round about every third, so 30%, every third um, um, study in 1980 um, on epilepsy had something to do with EEG, or at least use the term EEG. But this is going down. So basically, all other um, biomarker more or less go down, or at least not increasing, where people are talking about. But as you can see here, genetics is just starting. And what we are... Uh, Talk, uh, what we are seeing already in research um, is no reason to believe that we are already approaching some limitations or so, that we don't find new genes anymore or that we um, have suddenly figured things out. No, and genetics is really starting. And it's all, but again, I'm a geneticist. I'm really um, interested in my job. So, but one thing I just wanted to keep in mind, really, this is data, and you can see that already in 2019, 7% of all research studies which were containing the word epilepsy in, in the abstract, so likely to be an epilepsy study, contained the word sequencing, not even genetics, but just sequencing. So meaning that this was somehow related to a genetic screen. So genetics is coming, or is already here, actually. But it's very important to consider this um, kind of development if you develop, for example, educational programs. It's, um, not, you know, 20 years ago um, or 10 years ago, it might not have been relevant um, that a neurologist or epileptologist or pediatrician, um, pediatrician probably should, but, but an adult neurologist 
should not know about how sequencing works and what are the limitations and strengths and how to interpret a test, at least the basics of it. Um, Ten years was not needed. But imagine like in five years, right? So the next generation and also the current generation who is more and more involved with genetic testing should either have a professional in the institution and even better, have already some training in using genetic tests. Because what I see, for example, here in, in the Cleveland Clinic, when we look at our, in, in our patient management conference, when we're sitting with you know, 30 health professionals in, in, uh, in the room and discussing pa patients who get um, epilepsy surgery, they are, um, even the epileptologists, they have strong opinions on the MRI sometimes, right? And that's um, what in smaller centers even probably is even stronger. So, um, and this is good. And it's also important that an epileptologist can challenge a geneticist and asking the right questions and looking when, um, when looking at a genetic test result. So, because on the, um, because it's a very, to interpret a genetic test, you need a lot of information. Um, and the best profession is probably a genetic counselor here in the US um, or a human geneticist specialized on epilepsy or an epileptologist specialized on um, genetics. But frequently you don't have that and people need to work together and that's why it's important. So genetic testing and epilepsy. So what we notice here is that there's, um, you know, a, a limit... Uh, information out when a limited information out when it comes to how successful is genetic testing actually. And that's why well, Arthur from my group, um, he um, asked this systematically. And at the end, he screened like 3000 sequencing studies related to epilepsy, autism, intellectual disability, and came up at the end with 80 studies where he looked at and asked how frequently do, does an individual receive a diagnosis with a certain disease. And this story is very simple. Around about one in four to five individuals with either autism, interestability, or um, epilepsy will receive a diagnosis through a genetic test. And um, this is um, even more, if the, the, the diagnosis rate is a little bit higher if you do a more comprehensive test like the exome. So, and this is across all epilepsy. We are, I think out of these, all these studies, 50 studies were on epilepsy. And they are a little bit enriched for um, pediatric cases, but still um, keep in mind that all pediatric case um, kids, uh, all kids will become adults at some point, right? So um, I'm a strong believer that genetic testing, even if the rate might be more low, um, should be done um, as part of the you know um, um, makeup or uh, clinical makeup. Again, geneticist speaking. So next, so. One thing what we noticed, and this is a schematic which is outdated, but it's still good, um, is that only like 20 years ago, we had a handful of epilepsy genes. And this is really technology dependent because we didn't have the technology we have today. Um, just as an example, um, you, you, probably many of you have heard that. Um, if you wanted to sequence the whole genome, this is 30 billion letters in our uh, genome, you would have to pay $3 billion and 2000 Today, you can do it for $600. So... And the thing is, you don't need to sequence the whole genome for epilepsy genetic testing. So it's way cheaper. And with this, we were able to identify many, many new genes. And, um, you know, you can see already, like, just the last 10, 10 years, how many genes we have identified. And that slide is outdated. We have way more genes now. And there's a big debate how you want to, um, how you, if you want to call a gene an epilepsy gene or not. Because for most um, genes we have identified, the this order is rather complex. It's, it's frequently not um, a, clean, a clean epilepsy syndrome without comorbidities. Most of the time, it's more um, like it's a developmental syndrome kind of disorder where epilepsy can be the core syndrome or is more one of the many others. And it's really, so if people ask, you know, how many epilepsy genes we have, it's not really easy to answer. So we have, uh, also our group has been involved in many of such studies, but I will talk, come to this a little bit later. But if people usually ask um, how many epilepsy genes we have, um, I would answer with 100 to 200, depends how you want to define epilepsy. If it's a seizure disorder, it's bigger. If it's um, epilepsy is a more core, more core syndrome, then it's lower. So, and this is, the most of these genes which we have identified were those which are caused by dominant mutations. So one mutation is enough to cause the disease. However, and in now, re now in re in more the last two years, we identify way more recessive disorders. This has, this has something to do with statistical testing. So 
I personally believe there's way more genes to um, uncover, and I think data gives um, supports this um, comment. And so um, it's really important to um, keep up to date with the literature because um, every of those genes, has, um, you have to have some knowledge if you want to be able to make an evaluation later. But I'll come to that. So a quick way to um, get an idea what are the currently most important epilepsy genes is using the software. We have that developed that. So in particular, Eduardo, who we'll talk later. And here you can, for example, query the largest um, clinical database where um, patient variants have been reported from all disease. You can type in the, G um, the disease you're interested in. It's called here, this one is called um, simple clinva, and you can type in epilepsy. Then you get all epilepsy gene, the most frequent epilepsy gene. You can scroll here. But you can also filter for those where people were very certain that these um, are only pathogenic mutations. And then you get a different list. For example, I see 9 moves away because it's not really an, an epilepsy gene. So um, this is a very quick way um, um, to see what are the most important epilepsy genes. But you can also read um, into the literature and so on, um, which is a little bit challenging, actually, because there are many, for literally every gene which has a job in the brain, you find some, some study in relationship with epilepsy, which has not, nothing to do with what you think today um, with disease. So because the field is learning, the, the literature has a lot of biases, and it's really challenging. It's, again, that's why... I uh, would always recommend to con consider a professional um, focus on epilepsy genes um, in your genetic interpretation. So now we come to variant interpretation guidelines. So again, I, I like to stress that a lot. Um, so having the gene and the panel um, is not the solution. If you, sequen if you have a patient and you sequence um, hundreds of epi um, or genes and, po and potential epilepsy genes, you will find multiple hits. You will find multiple genes with a variant. And the question is now, which is it, you know, um, which causes the disease? Or maybe there's none, right? So how do you make this decision? And this is the biggest challenge we face now in all genetics. Point. So the genes finding, that was a little bit, most of the um, genes which we have already found, um, or the, which affect most of the patients, but now the interpretation, that's the biggest challenge. So, and this challenge is shown here in the following. This is also from Simple Clinva again, um, where Eduardo looked and asked, hey, among all those um, these, um, variants which were reported for epilepsy, so variants like mutations, um, what do people, how do people classify them? And what we see here is that the majority of them, the person who um, looked at the genetic test came up with the conclusion that they cannot classify it because there's, there's uncertain or info, um, they were uncertain. They cannot say if the variant is benign, so it's just normal human variation, or if the variant is likely to be pathogenic. So that's why the biggest chunk of genetic data, and this is not um, only for epilepsy, it's across all disease, is uncertain significance, meaning that we have a genetic test, we have some mutations, but we don't know what to do with this. So, and to overcome this problem and to get a little bit more um, to streamline the process and not to have the wild west, right? So, to, because that what happened before, to develop criteria, um, the community around ClinGen and where also many epileptologists were involved, and here's the paper which I refer always to, um, have came together and tried to give some limited criteria here. And the first thing is, does the gene have clinical validity? That's what I meant. You know, we have around about 100 to 200 epilepsy genes. But if you, for example, look at research databases and you type in any brain gene and you type in epilepsy, you will find articles which say it's likely an epilepsy gene. So you already have to be in the position that you can somehow distinguish between a true epilepsy gene and some bad reports from the literature. So that's the first thing. And then you have to, you know, distinguish between just the random mutation, which every epilepsy gene has, um, which doesn't do anything, doesn't do epilepsy, and the, the one which truly causes disease. So this requires a lot of knowledge about genetics and also family history and so other things which are really important for clinical genetic counseling, and that's why they're experts for. But it also requires a lot of knowledge about genetics and um, how mutations work in the human body. And here, for example, our group is developing software, and we'll come to this later. So here's some examples. Um, this gene, and you saw this in the previous slides, um, um, comes up in the databases as one of the top epilepsy gene, although it's not an epilepsy gene because we really um, learn a lot and, um, and something and some impressions we had in the past were not so, uh, or how, how to establish a gene as a disease gene. 
the foundation for that was um, less strongly developed like we do it today, for example. You know, the field is developing. So, and some, here's some others um, which have no relationship to epilepsy, some others which um, have are disease genes but not fit the phenotype, doesn't, so it doesn't fit the epilepsy. And here's again, I, I still like to stress this a lot. Um, it's very important that professionals with a lot of experience, or you can come, become one, but you have to spend really effort in, um, in looking at um, a genetic test result and do all these evaluations, right? So, and the best example, I think most of the audience will be neurologists and epileptologists. And what I always say is the following. So imagine me, I'm a geneticist um, coming, uh, working now since two and a half years or three years soon at the Cleveland Clinic. And me and my team, we are joining every week for two and a half hours, the patient management conference um, where patients get discussed um, if they should get surgery or not. Sometimes we come, some genetic discussions are there, but the other, the rest is just for ed educational purposes. That's why we are there. So this, so basically every week we are listening to like five, six cases which were discussed and where all the epileptologists, the neurologists, the MRI specialists, and so on, everyone discusses EEG, MRI, spec, MAC, and so on. So every week I, was, um, I personally see um, at least six EEGs which were discussed by a group of 30 experts um, for each, let's say, 10 minutes. So I, ha I have a lot, lot of you know, exposure to reading EEGs, right? Because I'm listening and look at this every week. Still, very sadly, I'm not good at it in interpreting EEGs. Basically, I'm really horrible at it. And I should not do it, and I actually cannot do it. So, so because I'm not an expert, I never did the hard training needed to interpret an EEG. Same for genetics. Only because you have genetic test results and you see them regularly doesn't make you an expert in interpreting test results. You should work with the company report as the first, talk to experts, or become an expert. And this is very important because I'm and speaking as a scientist who's really focusing on genetic testing, interpretation, and so on. A lot of genetic test results are report, um, interpreted false. And we can see this, that at least in the database, at least 20 to 30% of pathogenic variants um, are actually benign. So, and, but it's, it's changing now. The quality changes a lot in the last years, but it's really important to, um, to do the work and learn this and not do the mistakes others have done before. Before we didn't know that. So it's, it's okay, right? So that's why re-evaluation of tests is also important. Okay, so if you're an expert, then, then you know that sc 2 a fits to an epileptic encephalopathy. You know that the variant um, which causes a, such a severe disease cannot be in the general population. Missense variants are fine, and most likely, because it's an encephalopathy, the variant should be de novo. Um, if you're really on top of the literature, you might even say, hey, um, it's also possible that it's somatic or mosaic in the parent, but it's a little bit different topic. So there's a lot of things you have to be comfortable with. And, but it's easy to train um, um, in this if you spend a lot of time reading or you f um, join workshops. So I will not talk about this much. Eduardo will have a whole session um, in like 15 minutes about this. But I just wanted to know that there are guidelines which you can study and which you can apply. And the slides before were also how the guidelines can be applied to epilepsy. But the best thing is to, to work together in an interdisciplinary team where you have a genetic counselor, a geneticist, epileptologist, and people involved in, in um, uh, clinically. Okay, so, and there's a lot of things to consider um, on genetic level. Um, that's why um, I probably speak today. Um, is the variant, um, you know, wh what do we know about the variant? Has it been seen in, in general, in the general population? Has it been seen in other patients? What does it do to um, the active molecule in the body, which is the protein, and many, many other things? So, and there are many guidelines which are now outdated already. But um, again, Eduardo will talk about newer ones. And what I want to um, point out to um, this community is here, since this will be recorded, you can look back to this. Here's a quite good overview of current um, kind of um, web-based tools to interrogate a variant. And which, for example, our team is using on a daily basis. Um, but I have to also give a heads up with some of these tools we have developed. So um, that's why it's also a little bit self-promoting. That's why we're using. So another thing in, in promotion of our own um, kind of research and also education is we're giving workshops. So usually um, 
to get really a solid basis um, of about genetics, um, population genetics, and um, how this applies to variant interpretation and also how to do variant interpretation with, let's say, 20, 30 um, web-based um, softwares. Um, we usually do like a two to three day um, workshop. And um, after that, I think that you have this super foundation. If you have no one in your institute who can help you with this, um, or even if you're a geneticist and you don't have the training in using um, web-based tools or inter um, interrogate, for example, distance variants, um, such workshops um, can help. And I would really recommend to join such workshops. It doesn't have to be ours, but there are others who do this. I would really recommend that. Okay. So here's an example uh, um, of some basic rules, um, just how to think about this. You know, does the gene have clinical validity for my disorder? For example, s is the best studied epilepsy gene. We know this already since 20 years. And we know um, that um, it's particularly associated with um, the, um, epilepsies, which, which start around about month four to uh, one and a half years, and most frequently known for Dravet syndrome, so a really severe form of epilepsy. If you have a patient um, with a very mild um, adult onset epilepsy and you have a variant in SCM1A, that this is um, causing disease. And I talk now as a scientist um, who, who doesn't need to give clinical um, um, kind of assessments, but it's like one in 10,000 that, that this is pathogenic at all. I would have seen it cannot be pathogenic, but there will be always exceptions um, in, some, in nature. Nature is weird. But here, I would say that doesn't fit the phenotype. So the point I want to make is you need to know for the gene on what um, epilepsy type or what type of epilepsy it can fit. So it's not just, okay, it has seizure, uh, the patient has seizures that's on here we have a mutation in the epilepsy gene. That's not good enough. So, and also, for example, if you are know that the patient has a truncating variant, then you're... Um, chance that it's um, the, that the patient has a mild GEFS, GEFS, GEFS plus um, disorder is very low. So truncating variants, especially if they're not in the last exon, uh, nine out of 10 times or even higher, it's Trave syndrome. And we have, we're doing some research on this to quantify that. But um, this is also knowledge. You need to know the gene and you notice, you know, need to know the subtypes associated with it and the variant type. And since this is not complicated enough, so for some genes, like, for example, the green 2 a gene, you need to know for missense variants, so variants which change the protein, which modify it, where the mutation is located in the active molecule, which is the protein. So um, because you can have a very mild or a very severe phenotype, depending if the variant is in the transmembrane domain and, um, on, or the linker, or it's in some kind of other protein motif. So you, you have to know pr protein-level knowledge what's going on. So, and there are other examples for this. For example, um, if I see 2A, you can either have like a more autistic type of developmental disorder with or without seizures even. So, there are different versions. And there are the neonatal um, um, seizures. And they have very different implications of drugs. So, and I don't want to um, go to, to, to this in too much detail, but, um, you know, you can read about this. So, there's a lot of knowledge needed. So here I give you now a quick example um, how uh, some, you know, some genetic information can help in you know, interpreting a genetic test result. For example, um, here is a variant at position in um, 1,636 in the gene SCN1A, and the patient has epilepsy and developmental delay um, and uh, regression. So... Directly, people would, um, who are um, working with genetic data would say, oh, SC1A could be either Jeff's Plus or um, could be um, Dravet syndrome. However, it could also be familiar hemiplegic migraine if you ignore a little bit the epilepsy world because also there are some reports. And the first thing we, we can check is, is this variant is seen in, in a um, cohort of 140,000 individuals from the general population? And it's not. So this is already intriguing that it could be pathogenic, right? So if it's not seen in healthy people or of people from the general population. <clears throat> An additional thing is if you look at the literature um, on certain databases, you can see that many patients have been reported with the same variant. And here you could even look what happened to those patients and what is the clinical, um, what's the outcome. So that's was very informative in, for your individual case. However, you need to look at this data a little bit careful because how geneticists 
label a mutation changed over time and still is an ongoing process. So um, you need to consider this, otherwise you don't find the older reports. An additional thing is, um, I don't explain this tool here. This has been developed by the Melbourne Group um, of our Slavi Petrovsky. So here you can see regions uh, that points you to regions shown in red here in the protein. So the protein is like starting here and is ending here, which are more sensitive to be mutated. And we see that the mutation that position 1336 is located in such a region. In addition to that, so Eduardo from our team developed also a different kind of methodology, which looks um, where mutations are located um, in the sodium channels, not only in SC1, but also many others. And we can also see here that there is a significant enrichment of patient variants shown by this red bar here, and it's very significant, shown here in the p-value, for um, patient variants um, in that region over population variants. And you can also read here, know that also, you know, there are other epilepsy patients which have been reported, but also in the other genes like SCN8A, SCN4A, and um, SCN5A, disorders have been reported at that exact same region in there in proteins. So it's arguing a lot that this is a pathogenic region. So in addition to that, you can also um, um, figure out something about the seizure onset, which is very informative, the development delay, if the variant is de novo, and then you, uh, overall you can, can up can come up with a long list um, which can guide you if you have lots of evidence supporting that this variant is pathogenic. And then and, and that variant was not seen in healthy individuals, was seen in many patients before, is in a region which is very critical for protein function, shown by multiple kind of assessments. And that's why only from the genetic level, the evidence was overwhelming. In addition to that, the patient really fits also the description of SCM1A disorders, which is Strapi's syndrome. Okay, here's another example. He's a patient with a variant of uncertain significance and has um, um, epilepsy, but also uh, carbonomas. And here we see that the variant itself is not seen in the general population. However, a very at that exact same position, other types of genetic mutations have been seen. And also nearby there are mutations. And here we see that this um, position of from the uh, variant from that patient is not in such a red region. It's not in this, a critical region. Um, using this tool. And if you look at the, an additional tool, we see again that this region it doesn't look pathogenic, shown like here with these red bars. It's a region where we have lots of population variants shown here in, in green. So, and then if you look at the clinical representation of that patient, and we know, then we learn that um, SCN3 is primary associated with um, um, epileptic encephalopathy, sometimes with polymicrogyria, gyria, and, but never with carvanoma, so far at least. So and given all this information, and um, I, here you can also find the main phenotypes for, the, um, for your genes using the simple Klimber tool we developed. And get, based on that conclusion, we see no good evidence um, for pathogenicity for that particular variant. And that's a very quick assessment um, everyone of you who looks at genetic tests should be able to do, to be honest, should be able. Or at least work with someone who can work with you to make this assessment. And at the end, the clinician decides um, the interpretation, right? So, but there are a lot of tools which are relatively easy to do um, to follow all these guidelines. Okay. So in summary, there are around about um, one in four to five people with epilepsy will, if they get genetically tested, will receive a diagnosis. That means that genetics will be associated with the disease, will be the underlying molecular pathology. Then genetic test or interpretation needs professional training. That's I think I stress this a lot. Um, and I am, genetics is just in starting, right? And do, you know things are really to kick in, um, kick in at the moment, and um, it's it's a really demanding field because um, if you are clinically active and you don't have much time to read, it becomes challenging over time. <laughs> Okay, so with this, I would like to just give um, like a five-minute shout-out to our research just to see also where things go. So as a scientist, I would love to. <laughs> Seminars are good, but also a little bit showing uh, what you're doing. Okay, so at the end, um, I presented things um, before um, rather clear, clean, I, ho I hope, or straightforward. But at the end, it's a really um, a field which has many avenues for... Um, gaining knowledge still. And so not even, you know, for patients with monogenic disorders, 
patients don't look all the same. You know, there are probably other factors besides the environment and nutrition and drugs, but also other genetic factors which can play a role in why some patients have a little bit early onset, a little bit minor field type, or respond a little bit better to that drug, or don't respond at all. So, and there are good examples for monogenic disorders in genes, which have also some modifiers. Also, we have a new type of genetics, which is polygenic, where many, many risk factors together can push you over to have high susceptibility to develop seizures. And this is, these are all parts of uh, what we are interested in in our research group. So classically, as an epilepsy genetics group, we are part of many efforts, um, or some, some are so we're leading, um, to discover new epilepsy genes. And this is a major arm of our research. So, and this is still ongoing, and this is, these are global initiatives, which also um, um, we are part of, and also many probably of the um, people who joined this talk are part of our community. And this is um, amazing. And we, again, we have, have many, many epilepsy more genes to discover. So what we're also doing is, and we not just only discover the genes, but we work together with, with many, many clinicians on many, many specific projects and to understand what kind of, you know, subtypes are associated with each gene. Each gene and the patients associated with each genes are a little bit different. And there's also, even within a gene, it seems to be that there's a little bit umbrella disorder. See, as I mentioned before, there are some genes which can lead disease to gain and loss of function, others um, for other kinds of mechanisms. And it turns out if you collect many, many patients um, and the clinical data um, together, then you learn from for every gene a spectrum um, associated with this. And here we are collaborating a lot and we're helping with um, bioinformatics and bi um, computational biological methods to understand why some patients um, look a little bit more um, different than others. And sometimes it can be explained by where the mutations are located in the gene or in the protein and we um, interrogate that. Some other type of research, which um, our group is majorly involved in, like a very large international ILAE style um, 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 consortia is to discover new ep um, risk factors for epilepsy. Not, so not disease-causing variants, but those variants which confer risk to develop um, epilepsy. And here you need thousands of them that you are a person who is at very high risk. And for example, we published recently like the first um, polygenic risk study that we could show that some individuals have a really high load for um, so let's say 35,000 genetic risk factors for epilepsy, which gives them a high risk to develop epilepsy. And this is particularly true for gen genetic generalized epilepsy. And a recent follow-up paper, and it's very controversial, and I like that, it's, you know, sparks discussion. You could even show that these risk factors are seen in the people in the general population. And those people from the general population who don't have epilepsy, who have a lot of epilepsy risk factors, genetic risk factors, they perform a little bit less good in um, um, education and um, IQ tests in there, and some of them have, or they're also a little bit enriched for um, uh, mental health disorders. It's quite interesting. So, but it's, uh, but it's something which is, so this genetic risk of, um, is a very new theme, and that might explain why you see in some patients and some families that in every generation there are one or two patients with epilepsy, but if you do a genetic test, you don't find anything. Because these kind of polygenic risk we don't clinically test. That's a very new research area. So another thing what our lab is doing is we are trying to solve um, missing gaps, which are essential for policymaking. I mentioned before that Arthur from our team, did, uh, together with Yamile actually, has just <laughs> realized who is uh, <laughs> leading here, um, the, uh, the first assessment um, for, or the, the largest assessment for the diagnostic yield in clinical genetic um, testing for um, epilepsy, which hopefully can be used as a reference for um, reimbursement. And we could also recently report for the first time the uh, incidence and prevalence of more than um, 100 uh, monogenic epilepsies and probably 1,000 likely pathogenic disorders, uh, likely um, um, disease, uh, likely genes which are likely cause disease. So finally, um, one of the, of the largest emphasis of our um, research group is developing software, web-based software, that you as a um, user, as a biologist or clinician, are able to interrogate variants so that you can make the assessment if the variant looks pathogenic or not, that you get um, a tool in your hand, like an EEG, like an MRI, which you can eyeball and be able to um, make your own assessment if the variant looks pathogenic or not, that you don't have to rely on a score, 
most um, current genetic testing bioinformatic tools are, are scores. Finally, we also um, are involved in many um, more downstream analysis where we, for example, try to really use all the bioinformatics and computational approaches our research team is um, working on to um, make sense and move even the research forward and we have a large program on sodium channels, for example, and, but also other genes. And just as a brief summary, I would like to everyone um, who did this research and also all the consortia because um, epilepsy is really like a huge team effort um, to get all the patients and analyze them. So, uh, thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Dennis. So, the first question here says, several genes do not have an inherited defined pattern. So, what to do with these mutations that are reported to cause epilepsy but are heterozygous, especially if we don't have in silico available? So, um, so if you have a, um, so a genetic test result, I assume, so a variant, and you don't have the information about the inheritance pattern, is that correct? Oh, so, what he's saying is that there are many mutations that are not like with a specified inherited pattern. Mm -hmm. So he says that many of those mutations can be heterozygous and are reported mm -hmm. to cause epilepsy. So yeah. what other studies can you do if you don't have in silico available to expand yeah. this study? So, okay. So the good thing is um, everyone has, has the opportunity, to, if you have the variant, you have the opportunity to like do invariant assessment and Eduardo will give some examples and I also mentioned some bioinformatic tools how you can do it and the inheritance pattern is only one out of 10 12 things which go into the assessment of the variant so I would not worry about this too much so and um, I would always try to get it if possible because this is very um, that is very helpful for a genetic counselor in the interpretation but it's not necessarily needed um, depends really on the case but its own inheritance pattern is only one part out of 10 or so um, in the assessment of a variant. So the next question is about the meta-analysis, Arthur's meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. So uh, this person is asking how many genes were included in the target epilepsy panel? And if there was like uh, some kind of comparison between the large panels, those are above 600 gen genes, and the whole exome sequencing, and if they had some kind of difference in that. That's a, that's a good point. Um, we actually haven't compared large panels versus um, exome. We haven't done that. We only looked at across all panels. And since we included many old studies, um, many studies will only have looked at like 20 to 30 genes. So, um, so I guess I, I actually don't know the median number of genes included, but that will be, it will not be much. It will be probably be on around 80 or something. So we did not do the more comp uh, comp the comparison between comprehensive testing. But at the end, what is the point? You know, the thing is, um, and a comprehensive testing looks at 600 genes, and based on the technology, that's not much more financially expensive than doing an exome. And um, you still have the chance with an exome to identify a totally unexpected gene in the future if you look back into the data, which you cannot do with any kind of panel. So, if the question is, um, if you if you do have to do a tiered approach, which many um, health insurances require, that you have to do a panel first and then an exome. I would go with, you know, just a good epilepsy panel, which is at the moment 150 genes. And if that is negative, I would do the whole exome because from that on, it's anyways lucky guessing and the future will tell us. And then I would already keep the search space wider that your future assessment might have more chance of finding something. Yeah, so the next question is, is there a difference in the expression of epilepsy genes related to regions or continents in the world? So um, at the moment, what we expect is that the um, gene exp 
expression. So how how much um, protein we at the end or our mRNA and then protein we have at the end in our um, cells will be um, I, um, identical across uh, or similar, very very similar across humans. And also well, maybe the question is related to that and is if we have population specific um, epilepsy genes and so far that has not been found. And it's also unlikely because most epilepsy genes also do epilepsy um, in, in, in mice or many of them and, and also in other primates. And so it seems to be that those genes which can cause epilepsy are very conserved through evolution. They are present in all vertebrates or many vertebrates. And there's, it is less likely that um, one gene can cause epilepsy in, let's say, Europeans and, and northern Asians. However, modifying situations and how severe the disease is, that might be very much the case. But this is not what we can currently look at clinically. Okay, so next question is about does anti-epileptic medication screening in genetic animal models of epilepsy help in precision medication? I mean, um, so I, um, I guess for research purposes, um, of course. I think every... Um, kind of approach at the moment because um, 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 has its validity. So, I, I, yeah, sure, I think so. We also have a question that I think what they want to say is uh, if there is some kind of internet based resource where you can search for a specific variants in Latin America mm -hmm. and also from Brazil, if you have something um, like that available. And we, we don't have an internal resource. Um, there is the database Nomad, which we use, has some um, Latino um, genetic um, variants in there, but it's only like 5,000 or so. It's not much. It's, it's, it's improving now um, uh, this year and the next years. But um, no, I um, I think... Uh, do you know, Eduardo? Is there some... Not yet, but it, it, it's very likely to change in the next two or three years, but I think um, it's not. But the good thing is, we, and th this problem, what you, um, why you need to know, know this, is um, because you want to know if the variant you have seen is a population variant. That's why you want to do this. And you assume population variants don't cause disease. But we are now at the level that we understand the proteins that well, that we know some regions in the protein can have variants and others not. So even if you, um, you, you just by knowing the essential function, essential regions in a protein um, can help um, understanding, um, interpreting a variant. So yeah, so that's my answer. So we don't know and there's limited resources and also for Brazilians, but it will change in the next two years. There are a lot of, um, initiatives out, but already with the existing approaches, we can overcome a lot. So we have another question. What is the role of genetic testing in adults? Because we have a, a very good base for pediatric epileptology, but we don't have much knowledge about adult yeah. epilepsy and genetics. Yeah, I mean, that's a big problem, right? So, uh, so the question is, um, um, do kids become adults? <laughs> and then I guess so, right? So yes, genetic testing in adults should be done because there's nothing I'm, I'm arguing against it. So what is correct is that the population which we see in, in pediatric hospitals compared to adult hospitals is a little bit different ones because you, um, someone who has, um, let's say, 30 years of um, intellectual disability due to the seizures or with seizures as, um, might, have, might have go to different clinics. And um, an adult, um, adult epileptologist might less frequently see those. So if you would do, um, my guess would, uh, would be, if you do genetic testing in adults, your yield would be a little bit lower. Although the numbers I showed you before were across all epilepsies. So, but still, um, might be a little bit lower. But the biggest factor what, um, for, uh, for uh, factors which are associated with, if a genetic test is positive are the following. Is the earlier the onset of the epilepsy, and the more severe the um, epilepsy, like how often and if it can be treated or not, and if there are some other life-challenging comorbidities. 
the, if these factors are all true in an adult, the, 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 then it's very likely that this adult is very um, um, has a high chance of being genetic test positive. In addition to that, what adult clinics frequently see or um, um, neurological centers are individuals who have some kind of brain abnormalities like a focal cortical dysplasia, hippocampal sclerosis or um, tumors um, or other kind of um, malformations, um, which you can see in the MRI. And what we learned in the last few years is if you do surgery and you cut off these um, abnormalities and you look at the genetics of these structures, you will learn that one in four patients um, will be genetically determined um, based on these mutations. But these mutations are only present in these tissues, which look abnormal. And um, this is in, you know, like, it, like in cancer, where you also have the tumor in your body. And this is a new type of genetics, um, which many people also, us here at the Cleveland Clinic, are looking into. And um, so the rate of gen um, genetics um, is quite high. And if you think about um, surgery outcomes and evaluation of risk to develop seizures again, this will play a role And many people looking at this. Even so, this is typically more an older um, community. So, Dennis, uh, regarding that same topic, there is another question. What is your opinion about the current use of screening polygenic variants of susceptibility to develop acquired epilepsy, like with per people with TBI, with stroke, with tumors? Uh, I think it's an amazing research um, project. But um, since um, it's um, it, we, so the effects we have seen before um, were relatively mild, but clearly detectable, but n not clinically strong enough. So I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. Why do some people fall on the head and develop epilepsy, whereas others fall on the head and they don't? Why do some people um, go, um, take drugs and party for five days and develop seizures? Why, um, and others don't. You know, why do pe some people develop um, epilepsy after hydration and others don't? Why do some people have febrile seizures and others have fever and no seizures? The, some people have a higher risk to develop seizures. And I mean, obviously, we wrote a polygenic risk paper, right? So we are strong believers that um, your genetic background or your risk profile pushes you towards that. But at the moment, this is not close to, not even close to be clinically meaningful. So, but as a research project, I think it's an amazing research project and should be pursued. We are also looking at something like that, and it's very exciting research. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis. So, we have many questions, but we are going to move forward to Eduardo's presentation, and we can try to answer these ones at the end. Sure, so, we will be here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So our second speaker is Dr. Eduardo Perez Palma. He's a genetic researcher from Chile. He has worked under Dr. Lau mentorship, building several tools for variance interpretations and collaborated with an intensive network of clinicians characterizing the genetic landscape of patients with neurodevelopmental disorders and epilepsy. He currently works at the Genomic Medicine Institute of the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Eduardo. Thank you, Yamine, for that kind introduction. And first, I would like to thank the organizers also for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. On this uh, uh, second part of the talk, which is entitled Genetic Testing and Variant Interpretation, I would like to introduce to you the ACMG Guidelines, the American College of Medical Genetic Guidelines for Variant Interpretation. The objective of this uh, second part of the talk is to uh, provide you with some context on how these tools can be applied, uh, the tools that Dennis mentioned and that we have developed can be applied in a clinical context on variant interpretation. Um, so first, uh, I would like to give a step back and consider what are we dealing with when we are evaluating genetic variation. So first, uh, if you compare uh, two healthy individuals, you can expect that between them, they will, they will have uh, between four and five million nucleotides involved in genetic variation. And out of these, 150 to 200 variants can be expected to have a protein truncating effect. 
And even more significant, uh, you can expect between 10,000 to 12,000 missense variants between two individuals. Also, between 40 and 80 variants can be de novo, one or two of which uh, will fall within the coding portion of a gene. So regardless of the framework, uh, clinical, clinical genetic testing will find variants in, if you're treating, um, if you're evaluating a single patient or multiple patients, the question will be the same. The final question, which genetic variants out of all of these that I just mentioned are actually causing the disease? Um, here I show you a typical genetic test result. We have a patient that has been evaluated uh, for a gene panel sequencing study. This means that around uh, 200 genes, specifically, we can see here that 187 genes were sequenced. Uh, all of these genes are known to be associated with epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disorders. Variants were found, as I as I mentioned, and um, the clinical summary of the test results uh, can be uh, resumed in three main points. And uh, for this patient, three variants were found, one of which is a likely pathogenic variant in the gene ALDHC7A1. This variant uh, it's known to be associated with disease, but in a recessive uh, setup with a recessive mechanism. That means that the patient must have uh, two variants, one on the first copy coming from mom and the other on the other copy co coming from dad. So in a recessive setup, this gene is able to cause disease, but on the patient that we're evaluating, uh, this is not the case. In addition, we have two variants of uh, unknown or uncertain significance. That means that these variants fall within the, a gene that it's likely to uh, be associated with epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disorders, but we're not sure if this variant is causing the disease or not. So the state of the variant is not conclusive. Overall, genetic, uh, genetic tests are not, uh, the genetic test results are not final and require expert clinical interpretation. Results are most of the time inconclusive. Um, to be specific, more than 70% 70, 70 of variants uh, fall, uh, are, are classified as of unknown significance. If you consider only missense variants, which are the more common, but the ones that are also the most difficult to interpret, this percentage comes to uh, rise to 90% of variants being classified as unknown significance. At this point, clinical knowledge is crucial and additional variant interpretation methods can help to further understand uh, the genetic test. So we come back to our original question. When is my variant pathogenic or benign? What do you think? Um, a lot of uh, criteria can arise trying to answer this question. Is my variant present in the general population, for example? Has my variant been evaluated uh, functionally or on, our, or on an experimental setup which we can know if the variant has an effect on the protein function? Has my variant been observed in other patients with similar phenotypes? And so on. So uh, even more important than uh, the number of criteria that arise, uh, which one of them is more important than the other? And the combination within, within these uh, answers are li limitless. So for this purpose, a group of scientists, uh, expert clinicians, and laboratory, laboratory, laboratory test groups came together and developed what it is now known as the ACMG guidelines and standard uh, for variant interpretation uh, methods. So to explain what they uh, produce, how to interpret variant and disease relationships, we like to use uh, an analogy because deciding uh, which variant is pathogenic or disease causing um, or benign deciding which uh, state is going to be assigned to a variant is pretty much similar to how to solve a crime. In a trial, you will have a variant that it's accused to be causing the disease on Mrs. Sick. And there is a judge that must decide if the, if the variant is guilty or not, or 
specifically if the variant is pathogenic or benign. During this trial, evidence will be presented for pathogenicity, but also alibis for uh, a benign state. So again, in summary, we have the accused, which is the variant, and the victim, who is the patient. And uh, multiple evidence and alibis will arise to make a conclusion that will be done by the judge, which will be, uh, which can be you. Um, so the ACMG guidelines is the uh, whole group of uh, evidences and alibis uh, grouped together in a systematic way. And, and this was decided as a guidelines. These are not fixed rules as we, uh, as we will further evaluate later. And these guidelines are 31 interpretation criteria for classifying sequence variants. As I said, it was developed by scientists, clinical laboratories, and clinicians. So it's an inter interdisciplinary field where uh, different uh, experts come together to uh, provide their own insights. Here I show you the 31 criteria. Um, I, I do not intend to re read them one by one, but we, it's really important to acknowledge that we have uh, very strong arguments at the top. We have uh, a set of strong arguments with less priority than the very strong argument, then follows down by moderate arguments of pathogenicity. Then on a lower level, we have only supporting arguments for pathogenicity. And these are all evidences. Then on the alibi side, we have strong arguments for, ben for a benign state, and we also have supporting uh, evidence for a benign state. Overall, uh, as an example of a very strong evidence, is, is if we find a variant that has a PTB uh, effect. That, mean, that means a protein truncating variant which include nonsense variants, frame sheets, splice sites affected, uh, codon stop affection, uh, and so on. But this is only valid on genes that are known to, to lead to disease as a loss of function mechanism, because in the presence of PTB variants, you lose one copy of the gene, as Dennis mentioned before. So if you find a PTG variant in a gene that is not associated or not commonly known as haploinsufficient, as haplo this is not a very strong evidence for pathogenicity. So it only applies on genes that we know that can cause disease through this mechanism. Then on a strong evidence, that means on a lower priority than before, uh, we we can find uh, well-established in vitro or in vivo functional studies supporting for the damaging effect of the gene and the gene product. That means uh, the variant evaluated on a functional study, not the gene. Because a gene can harbor benign and um, pathogenic variants within it. And uh, so we need to provide evidence for the variant causing an effect on the final function of the protein. On a lower uh, end of criteria for pathogenicity, we have moderate evidence. For example, here we can find an argument if the variant is located in a mutational hotspot or a critical well-established functional domain, for example, the, near the pore in a sodium channel, for example, or uh, in critical domains from, for the protein function. These uh, hotspots are usually also constrained from, vari from variation in the general populations. So uh, this argument can also be evaluated within others. Even on a lower end of uh, evidence for pathogenicity, we have multiple lines of computational evidence and, uh, that support a deleterious effect on the gene or the gene product. Here, it involves conservation studies. If the site of my, my variant is conserved among uh, gene, gene orthologs or paralogs, evolutionary constraints, and so on. On the alibi side, that means evidence for uh, a benign state. Uh, if my variant is observed in the general population, it's less likely to be causing a severe phenotype such as uh, a neurodevelopmental disorder. For this, we can check NOMAD database that harbors 140,000 uh, people with no, uh, no evident uh, disease. Uh, 
And, and if my, if my baron is present there, it's a strong alibi for a benign state because it's present in the general population. Then on a supporting level, we have uh, variants that are infirmed deletions or insertions in a, in a region that it's repetitive without any known function. So vari genetic variation can happen all over the genome. And if, it's, if it is found in a, in a region that is not commonly uh, associated with any function or coding uh, gene, it's also a supporting um, evidence for a benign state. Um, it's important to highlight that computational approaches uh, can help in the, um, in the implementation of the ACMG guidelines. Here I highlight uh, five arguments uh, of different uh, levels of confidence to include in the variant interpretation process. We, we have uh, strong arguments, moderate arguments, and supporting evidence for pathogenicity that can all be uh, addressed by computational methods. But this is, uh, it's important to highlight that these are five out of 31 uh, criteria that must be evaluated during the variant interpretation process. So it's really important to uh, include also the, the clinical expertise here. And the, the variant interpretation cannot be called, it's uh, only by computational methods. Um, out of this computational approximation, we can, we can distinguish two groups uh, of uh, variant interpretation tools. The ones that evaluate the biological context of the variant that was found in the patient. That means uh, evaluating how extreme is the chemical exchange of the amino acid that is affected. It's not the same to have uh, the exchange for uh, an amino acid that is similar to the one that it was suspected than having a complete different uh, structure uh, replaced. We have some structural features, uh, conservation criteria, and during the, the past few years, uh, a lot of uh, meta tools and mach machine learning algorithms have, have, have been trained uh, using and integrating multiple uh, features that I mentioned before to generate um, a score of pathogenicity with quite uh, well specificity and sensitivity. And uh, here in this, uh, in these blocks, I, I show you one of the most famous uh, variant interpretation tools out there. And um, these uh, do not, are not exclusive to each other. So sometimes you can find damaging effects from one tool and then um, a, tolerant, a, a tolerated effect on, on the other. So, uh, at this point on the computational approximations, you can also find inconsistencies. And, and people usually address this by selecting the uh, best performance tools and also by combination of criteria, let's say having uh, a positive damaging effect predicted by three um, variant interpretation tools. So this is the uh, biologi biological context of computational approximations. But we also have a frequency context that is in fact more powerful than the computational approach uh, mentioned before. Because uh, here we can explore how variants are observed in the general population, as we mentioned before. And also we can use computational approaches to um, search in uh, large public databases and uh, clinical repositories of variants from all around the world and ask if, if my variant has been observed in other patients uh, from different um, places. So if my, if my variant was found present in another, in another patient with a similar phenotype, it's a strong argument for pathogenicity, as well as if my variant is commonly found in the general population, it's a strong argument for a benign state. Um, integrating the computational approximations to the complete set of uh, criteria provided by the ACMG guidelines will allow us to distinguish between a guilty state or a not guilty state. That means on one extreme, a benign variant, not guilty, and a pathogenic variant that will be guilty of, of uh, causing the disease on the patient. 
But we also can call uh, intermediate states like likely benign and likely pathogenic. And if we found, uh, if we find, and this is m the most common case, if we find conflicting evidence or not enough evidence to make the call of benign and pathogenic, and the uncertain, the famous or infamous uh, state of uncertain significance can be assigned through the use of the ACMG guidelines. Um, so how do we render the verdict? Um, the ACMG guidelines uh, state several um, combinations of criteria that um, show us the precedence uh, of how they should be considered. For example, to call a variant pathogenic, we need a very strong argument and a strong argument, as well as a very strong uh, criteria proof plus two moderate criteria considered. A likely pathogenic variant then can be called if we find a strong argument for pathogenicity and two, uh, and two supporting arguments for pathogenicity. All of this in the absence of uh, positive criteria for benign variants. On the other side, we have uh, likely benign calls if we are in the presence of a strong argument for benign variants and also a supporting evidence is also found. Similarly, if we find just two supporting evidence for benign, um, for benign variants, we can make a call also uh, that my variance is, is in fact a likely benign. Uncertain variants, variants of unknown significance, can be called in the absence, in the absence of uh, any argument, which is, uh, doesn't happen much often, but uh, we find uh, commonly that these arguments can be in conflict with each other, and then we cannot make a call on either side, pathogenic or benign. Um, of course, the guidelines are guidelines, are not fixed rules. So uh, different interpreters or judges can have uh, different uh, verdicts. Gathering information on each of the criteria is quite complicated, and it requires that uh, the judge uh, is has keep up with the literature and the novel methods or uh, patients reported in, um, in, in publications. Uh, the general guidelines, as I said, uh, on how to assess assess it, each criteria cannot be um, called by uh, com exclusively by computational methods or a specific algorithm. And it happens commonly that inconsistent variant interpretation can be found for the same variant. As Dennis mentioned before, if we call uh, a variant with a gene panel uh, with an exome sequencing and found a variant in a gene that is not associated uh, to disease, if two years later there is found evidence for that gene to be actually causing neurodevelopmental disorders, that, uh, that variant can be reinterpreted uh, and change their state of uh, variance of unknown significance to a pathogenic one just because of the update of the literature. And this happens a lot. So, um, as I mentioned, um, the combination of criteria and the amount of criteria can uh, be quite a burden for the, the people that are trying to interpret variants. So for this, and as a tool to help uh, clinical experts in, in the pursuit of the, vari the correct variant interpretation, the following the publication of the American College of Medical Genetic Guidelines, uh, the interval tool was published um, in 2015. And what it does, what it does is, is that it allows you to have a judge assistant that will help you to collect the alibis and the evidence in just one place uh, in a semi-automatic uh, way. It's designed to interpret the clinical significance of the variants. It's easy to use, almost out automatic, as I said, but it also provides advanced um, tools like command line tools. But uh, here I will show you the uh, one example of how this can be used to help you uh, in the variant interpretation process uh, through a web app. 
what the tool uh, does is that it acquires everything that can be collected to uh, from each of the criteria provided by C the ACMG guidelines. It collects all of the arguments and from all of the databases that it has access, uh, helps you assign a positive state on each of the checklists, uh, if you want, of uh, each of the criteria provided by the guidelines. But it allows you, and it makes an initial call out of the five states, Interbar inter will help you decide if the variant is benign, likely benign, if it is of uncertain significance, a likely pathogenic state, and a pathogenic state. But this is just, and this is really important to highlight, this is just an initial uh, interpretation. The tool allows, allows you to perform further research and uh, modify criteria according to your own judgment to make a final interpretation. I will show you an example uh, of, of this. Um, the interval tool on the web page looks like this. It allows you to introduce any variant found in through exome sequencing or gene panel sequencing. That's uh, not uh, it's not in, it's not involved how you obtain the variant, which is also really important to consider. And it allows you to introduce the chromosome, the genetic position, and the exchange observed uh, in your patient. The call the uh, I will show you how it works uh, with an example. Let's say a, a pretty um, superficial example, if you may. But let's say we have a girl, six months of age, with febrile seizures. The diagnosis is unreal, un unclear, but we have performed a gene panel sequencing that was able to identify a variant in uh, chromosome 16 on this position and a one in, uh, changing for a side seat. The parents, you know, are, uh, were also tested, and they are negative for this variation, which means that the variant is de novo. The test results report a variant of unknown significance. And this is your starting point um, to use the ACMG guidelines. If you uh, use Intervar as a tool to uh, help you with it, you will uh, find yourself introducing the variant to Intervar, and the first uh, result will yield that and confirm the genetic test result will confirm you that the variant is of unknown significance according to the genetic test results and also to interpar. Uh, but this is not, um, this is only the beginning because uh, you can adjust and uh, modify the criteria uh, performed on, on this calling. And if you search on some of the computational approaches that we have mentioned, you will find out that that, various, that variant is in fact uh, within a pathogenic enriched region, and also that this variant is conserved between gene family members on a, on a hotspot that is constrained from variation in the general population. So you have explored already here additional computational approaches that are not included on uh, interval itself. So you also know that the variant is de novo, that it's absent from uh, the parent. And this is a strong argument for pathogenicity too. So within interval, you can modify these two arguments and recall the variant. In this example, if you do this, you will find out that your variant, uh, after the correction, the manual correction from uh, the interpreter, in this case, the judge, will call this variant a pathogenic one. So at the end, uh, with the help of these tools and your clinical expertise, you will uh, be allowed to uh, make a call and judge that the variant was actually making uh, Mrs. Sick sick. So uh, out of concluding remarks uh, and some advices, uh, variant interpretation is strongly dependent on the individual that is performing the procedure. Keeping up with the literature is crucial because we're acquiring more knowledge uh, every month that passes. And um, it requires time 
and it, it's always because the 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 process is so sensitive uh, through uh, with the patients that you need to be conservative. Acquit the accused for want of evidence. And at all points, it requires medical experts to address the variant interpretation. Um, overall, variant interpretation is not trivial, but you can train yourself in, in this uh, field. ACMG guidelines also evolved. The ones that I described you today are from 2015, but they were previous guidelines from 2008 and 2000, and it's very likely that these guidelines will be updated soon as uh, technologies and knowledge improve. Um, always it, it needs to be focused on guidance by medical experts, and it is essential to correctly classify variants in a clinical setting to ensure diagnosis and appropriate treatment, especially with the, the upcoming new technologies and treatments that are coming from um, gene therapy approaches that we're really confident that will help uh, future patients. So overall, I would like to say uh, thank you to all the team, and uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So we have some other questions. So how do you usually approach a patient that has multiple possible pathogenic variants? Um, well, you, you can establish priority over the variants. So uh, you can found within a patient a pathogenic variant, but also a likely pathogenic variant. And the first one will take precedence. Um, it can be possible also to find um, multiple variants on the same individual that are of the same uh, importance. And, and this can give rise to really heterogeneous genotypes or more severe ones. So it, it's possible to find two, uh, two variants on the same uh, individual. Okay, so we have another question. Do you think that epigenetics knowledge helps in understanding the genetic disorders in a better way in the clinical context? Um, epigenetics for sure, for sure plays a role. Um, the gene needs to be expressed in order to uh, have their effect. Uh, but on a, on a clinical setup, I think we're a bit far away from that uh, still. But there, are, there has been some studies that are able to identify through epigenetics uh, different subtypes of patients that um, present themselves with different uh, clinical outcomes. So, for oh. sure, it plays a role. Thank you. So, we have another question. Autism and intellectual disability are very often linked to epilepsy. Will you also go for sequencing even without visible epilepsy? Many loss of functions in SCNN2A will otherwise remain undiagnosed. Uh, yes, I, I will go for uh, sequencing even the absence of epilepsy, especially because these patients can develop epilepsy, epilepsy with time. So um, if a gene, for example, is later, later expressed in development but harvests a mutation there, it will cause uh, epilepsy later. But also, uh, patients are really heterogeneous in their presentation. Same variant can cause epilepsy and not in different uh, individuals. And uh, in the same uh, framework, intellectual disability and aut autism spectrum disorders can be present uh, in different patients too. May I add? Sure. Just, um, just a quick add to that one. So every disorder where you don't have an obvious external cause, like a car crash or something. So it's, it's a really simple rule as from a genetics perspective. If this disorder is early onset and leads to the situation that the individual is challenged in life, imagine like 200 years ago or whatever, 500 years ago, that person has a really hard time surviving because the medical um, support is not that strong. So every disorder which is early onset and leads to really ch um, evolutionary pressure, so selections, really hard time in life, without external cause, has a high chance that it's genetic. So ignoring the epilepsy, I would 
test that individual for sure, um, just from a genetics perspective, not necessarily related to the epilepsy. Okay, thank you. So this is another question. What about incomplete penetrance? Should it be pay attention in interpreting results? Yes, uh, yes, for sure. That that can be observed too, and it can interfere with the variant interpretation because you can find variants that are not causing the disease in some individuals, and they do another. So um, there are other possible reasons to explain the incomplete penetrance. Um, it has to do also with gene expression too, and. Um, we also, to, to understand that, uh, we need to gather um, a fair amount of patients with variant to understand what are the outcomes that can be expected. Yeah, but, yeah. but very briefly, in action, uh, if you think about what is currently thought about clinically actionable, there is not a single incomplete penetrant variant out which is, has clinical or patient management, uh, has an effect on patient management. So because there is for sure an incomplete penetrance because then we are, we are approaching this risk um, um, type of mutation. But at the moment, these incomplete variants, they, don't, they are not clinically meaningful. They might be um, meaningful in terms of maybe is that one of the reasons why that person has epilepsy or is a contributor to that? Okay. But it doesn't have an effect on management because that variant is not important enough um, to affect some kind of different treatment decisions or um, drug resistant. Uh, drug uh, decisions um, based on our current knowledge. So at the moment, it's nothing we have to consider about. But it might change. Yeah. So this next question is linked to a question that we did before Eduardo's presentation. So what he says is that if we didn't find a cause after a large gene panel or a whole exome sequencing, should we do a whole genome sequencing? And if yes, Probably large gene panel with next whole gene sequencing is more useful and cost effective than only whole exome sequencing. Um, uh, well, uh, ideally, uh, whole, whole genome sequencing will be able to find additional variants that are not uh, that were not able to detect either through gene panel sequencing or uh, whole exome sequencing. Um, we can find, for example, uh, variants in non-coding regions, variants leading to poison exons, variants leading to uh, what other example? Yeah, just translocations. Or yeah, like large deletions and translocations. So uh, yes, it's uh, it's recommended to go from uh, a progressive way, but in an ideal world, uh, just to because time is really relevant for uh, treatment, if, if available. And the sooner we detect the variant and we're able to make a diagnosis, the more potential benefit the patient can have. So in an ideal world, uh, we will perform a whole genome sequencing immediately. Yeah, and so what was really interesting is this is really coming out on the research of the last one and a half years. And I saw like people, many research groups and from the Pacific and Asia or in Australia could show that there are types of familiar and um, sporadic epilepsies which are based on a nucleotide expansion where you suddenly have repetitive regions in the um, genome which are suddenly very frequent in patients. So like what is, for example, known for how Huntington's disease works, that you have like a, a tree nucleotide, so like three letters expansion many, many times. It's and if you have it more than 30 times, suddenly you have uh, mild Huntington, if you have more than 60 times, and you have really severe Huntington. Something like this we have observed with new research also for um, um, epilepsies. And to detect this kind of variants with high confidence, um, whole genome sequencing uh, will be the best technology. That will certainly mm. be come to the clinic very, very advanced. Um, companies probably implement this at the moment. So, um, because that seems to be really also solving some unsolved patients at the moment. Yes, and just to uh, remind you about um, the meta analysis results, the diagnostic yield through uh, whole exome sequencing that evaluates uh, all the genes, the coding portion of the genome, uh, has a 20 to 30% of success. And it's only 1% of the coding portion of the genome. 
So uh, there has to be more genetics uh, down there. Yeah, and everyone who deals with epilepsy surgery should um, sequence the brain tissue after surgery because what I mentioned, in research for specific types like malformations, um, like larger malformations, focal cortical dysplasia, even some kind of st uh, vascular structures or and, and tumors, around about one in four patients will have a genetic defect which is very localized. All your other cells in your body are fine. But these brain regions have cells which leads to these um, malformations. And that certainly will have an effect on, um, uh, it's not proven yet, but it's, it makes sense, which is very bad to argue with, but it has the potential that this plays an, um, an, a role in seizure recurrence and that's it, insulin, for example. That's very interesting. So this is another question about the link between pharmacogenetics and epilepsy. So somebody asked, what do you think about pharmacogenetics in relation to refractory epilepsy and if there is some related variants to, such as an excluding bias from other factors that can help in that interlink between pharmacological aspects and genetics? Um, well, the Pharmacogenetic, pharmaco responses are, are usually studied by uh, evaluating multiple patients on how they respond to different treatments. But uh, from a genetic point of view, uh, common variants uh, have been evaluated and how they influence uh, pharmacogenetic responses. But I will say that the results are not that uh, encouraging from that point of view, just from a common variant perspective. It's possible, of course, that rare variants or the novel variants that are uh, detected through gene panel or exome sequencing um, can have an effect on how uh, the drugs uh, are functioning. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. I think that's right. And just to add to this a little bit, depending on how, how you want to def define it, right? If you compare, compare pharmacogenomics to response to drug in combination with genetics, Basically, every monogenic epilepsy will, um, if you have a mutation in SC1A, you're guaranteed to be pharmaco um, uh, non responsive um, if, you, if it's a stop codon. Same as for CDK5, SKSNQ2, and so on. If you have a severe variant, um, you can test it at birth. You will know that the patient will not respond to anti epileptic drugs, um, depending on the gene, but more or less, it's predicted like 100% certainty. But if what people usually talk about is like talking about adverse effects, or about more common types of epilepsy where the genetic contribution itself um, is not really understood, but you think maybe is that person more likely to benefit from that drug or something and so on. And here the evidence is super weak. So many of my colleagues will hate me now for that comment, but it's true. If you, um, there are three or four good studies where you could show that if you take certain drugs, then you get rash or something um, because people um, with certain genetic configurations don't respond well to certain drugs. But everything else, um, all studies which looked at some kind of polymorphisms, um, and there's like one or two more examples, but most, um, but most of all other studies which try to identify if refractory focal epilepsy patients, if refractory generalized epilepsy patients, um, which are otherwise not sig um, significantly different than the average other average type of epilepsy, there's no good, there's no variant or polymorphism or metabolizer with strong bi um, um, which has replicated or has um, been identified in a randomized trial or has really proven unbiased proof that pharmacogenomics and epilepsy works, besides three or four examples. And they have been like recently published like two large GWASs, so these genome association studies where people try to look at three, 4,000 patients and um, with different um, categories for responding to different kind of um, sodium channel blockers or different kinds of epilepsy um, um, kind of drugs, and nothing came up. So there's some suggestive stuff, but nothing really um, convincing. Yeah, we, we definitely need more research on the subject. And I also, well, coming back to the previous question, um, w um, ethnicity may play a role also in, in through common variants on uh, the drug responses. But currently it has only been studied uh, systematically on um, European ascending populations. Mm 
Okay, thank you very much, Eduardo and Dennis, for these amazing talks. So, for the for the people that are joining us, please remember to fill today's evaluation. Thank you for joining us. And remember, our next topic will be Basic Concepts of Neonatal EEG by Dr. Elia Pestana Knight, also from Cleveland Clinic, and hope to see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.